Greetings, DAC family. I don't think I need to introduce Ross Ballard to most of you. Ross and Ashley, for the last couple of years, have been our missionary interns and serving here at the church in various capacities as they prepare to be launched to international ministry with the Christian and Missionary Alliance just in a few months, June of next year. However, Ross was recently ordained by the Christian and Missionary Alliance right here at DAC at District Conference. As I'm away this week with my wife and with family, I am excited that Ross is going to be bringing the Word of God today as Reverend Ross Ballard. So I commend him to you and know God is going to speak to us through him. God bless you. As we get started this morning, um, some, some background information. Why have I chosen the passage I've chosen? How did we arrive here? Well, I'm going to be speaking from Isaiah chapter 16. Uh, simply put, the reason being for that is that this is my daily reading. This is where it has led me, is through the prophets. I've recently finished the book of Isaiah, so naturally I just went into Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is the most peculiar book, um, so very unique visions and, and um I think that, that God has something special for you guys today. I remember telling Chris Davis that this would be my topic, and he seemed pretty interested, and I think that's due to the fact that I don't think Ezekiel's talked about too much. Um, but as we prepare to get into 16, I'm only going to be doing the first 14 verses, and the reason for that is if you read the rest of Exodus 16, it is the large, or Ezekiel, sorry, it is the largest chapter in the book, but it's also filled with some very graphic imagery. Um, that I think would be best read in your own time. Um, but it does paint a very vivid picture, and it's a picture we need to see here today, church. And uh, before we get into it, some background information about kind of the setting of the scene. Okay, so we're in the book of Ezekiel. I'm jumping you probably a, a fourth of the way through the book. Um, and the reason being uh, is that this is appropriate for the time, but how did Ezekiel get here? Well, if you remember roughly around 600 B.C., uh, because Israel didn't get its act together and continue to live lawless lives and do things their own way, doing what each thought was right in his own, in his own head, uh, God, seeing fit to punish and criticize his people Israel, did something out of the ordinary. Uh, and he tells us discipline is good, right? Someone who's loving shows discipline. But he says that he sends a foreign power, a foreign nation, great in power, to come and to besiege Jerusalem. And roughly about 600 is when they come knocking on the door and they put up a siege. And we know the end result is that they actually do conquer the city. They take the city and they burn the temple and they steal things from the temple. And not only that, they deport a large number of the Israelites back to their homeland of Babylon. Well, they took a lot of wealthy people. They took a lot of educated people. And lo and behold, Ezekiel was one of the men who was taken to Babylon. He's roughly 30 years of age. Five years after being taken there he starts to see his first vision from God. His first vision is very unique, but it sets the stage, and it's a very splendid vision where he sees the four, four creatures, if you will, and they have, they have wheels beneath them. And atop these four figures is a platform, it's a throne, and seated upon the throne is this majestic, regal figure that... It talks about his upper half and his lower half. And you can't see the face of the figure. His radiance is too great. And so this is his first vision. And Ezekiel goes on to receive visions. So a prophet is simply a man or woman who speaks on behalf of God. God has given them a message to declare to the people for the appointed time and for an appointed purpose. And Ezekiel's message is for the people Israel. Uh, and the first half of the book is devoted, sadly, to judgment. And it's all about what Israel's punishment will look like if they don't change things, if they don't turn around. And not only for them, but also for the surrounding nations, uh, the pagan nations that surround them, and, and for all the world. And the latter half of the book, the final verses and chapters are all about God's restoration. 
And it's not just restoration for Israel, but it's restoration for the surrounding pagans, and it's for all of creation. And so I planted you today in, in kind of the, the darker theme and darker motif. Um, and so there is hope in this passage, so do bear with me. But uh, I think that's enough precursor. Let us get in. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to break down the verses. And then we're going to look at what the rest of the chapter, kind of a summary, and then God's concluding words. Uh, all the while bearing in mind that the Lord's declaration is our theme. You'll see it's oft repeated, I believe at least three times in our reading today in just the 14 verses. Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord commanded, the Lord has decreed, any, any of that. And that is prophet talk, because if a prophet is to give a message to God, he must... He must first state that this is God's message. This is not my personal message. This is a message I have delivered unto God for you. He's done nothing to merit this. God simply chose him and gave him this message. Uh, and so this, this 16th chapter, again, I'm picking up in verse 1. I will now read. The word of the Lord came to me again. Son of man, explain Jerusalem's de detestable practices to her. You are to say, this is what the Lord God says to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, your umbilical cord wasn't cut on the day you were born. And you weren't washed clean with water. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one cared enough about you to even do one of these things out of compassion for you. But you were thrown out into the open field because you were despised on the day you were born. I passed by you and saw you lying in your blood, and I said to you as you lay in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you as you lay in your blood, live. I made you thrive like plants of the field. You grew up and matured and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed and your hair grew, but you were stark naked. Then I passed by you and saw you, and you were indeed at the age for love. So I spread the edge of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I pledged myself to you, entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I washed you with water. Rinsed off your blood and anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and provided you with leather sandals. I also wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with jewelry, putting bracelets on your wrist and a ch chain around your neck. I put a ring in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful tiara on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was made of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. You became extremely beautiful and attained royalty. Your fame spread among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I bestowed on you. This is the declaration of the Lord God. So we have two symbols that take place in this, this short reading. The first being the symbol of a child that's left to die, and the second being an, a, a symbol of that child who has now grown and matured into a young adult that is at marriageable age. Uh, and the rest of the chapter follows the adult child, so that the whole, cha the whole chapter has in view this one, one individual. So let us just go through and, and, and talk through the verses here. The word of the Lord came to me again. So again, Ezekiel has now received an additional vision. He had seen many other unique visions. And Ezekiel had a most peculiar life. Uh, some of the weird things that he had to do that are really found in the opening chapters of the book, one of the things he had to cut all his hair off and split it into three partitions. And in one of the partitions, he had to throw into the wind and cut with a sword. Um, one thing that he had to do that was unbelievable was that he had to bind himself and lay on the ground on one side for over a year. Now, if this wasn't the word of God, that would sound utterly preposterous to me. But because it's the word of God, I take it for truth, and I believe that really happened. And he was fed, and guess how he was fed? 
he would have been fed on the dung, his own dung that had cooked the bread. But he pleaded with the Lord and asked that it might be an animal's dung instead. And God acquiesced to his request. This Ezekiel was told from the get-go that his message would not be received well. That he would be despised and rejected and scorned. And he was. But yet again, God is still speaking through this man. He was roughly a prophet for two decades. He served in the, his tenure. And so yet he's received this new vision from God. And it's, again, for Jerusalem, for Israel. Explain Jerusalem's detestable practice to her, practices to her. So she is living in lawlessness. His people Israel, his own people who want nothing to do with him anymore and have begun to serve false gods. At this point, the temple itself has two statues erected, with, erected within the inner court to foreign gods. And so at this stage, when Ezekiel has received this vision, that opening vision I told you about the, the throne, that throne was situated above the temple. Well, it says, as you read throughout, that, the, that that God, that figure of God, actually leaves the temple and goes to Babylon. And so that's where he is now when he's speaking to Ezekiel. You are to say, this is what the Lord God says to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. If you guys remember the beginning, the origin stories of the Jewish people... Abraham was the man, Abram at the time. Abraham was not a Jew. He was from the Ur of the Chaldeans. Chaldea is another name for Babylon. That's where Abraham was from. He didn't serve God. He didn't know who God was. He served pagan gods. But yet God saw in his omniscience to reach out to this man and make him the father of his nation. And he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you in Genesis 12. That's when he initiates this covenant with Abraham. So that's what he's saying. Your birth, your origins were from, from people that, that lived in the land of Canaan. Remember, they were told that they would once again seize the land of Canaan after they had been kicked out and were living in Egypt and they march around the, the, the Sinai, the desert, and they finally make their way back to the land of Canaan. And remember the, the opening scenario when they, with Joshua leads them through Jericho. And the walls collapse. They have now entered into Canaan. So when it says Canaanites, it's a summation of all the many tribes that make up these people. One of them being the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all the ites uh, that you're familiar with. So that's just a broad term for all of these peoples. And he's saying that, that you were born of a people who had nothing to do with me. As for your birth, your umbilical cord wasn't cut on the day you were born, and you weren't washed clean with water. You were not rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one cared enough about you to do even one of these things out of compassion for you. This child was cast into the desert without even tying the umbilical cord. What do you think that says? This child was left for dead. Clearly, no one cared for it. And he's likening Israel to this child. But you were thrown out into the open field because you were despised on the day you were born. I passed by you. So this is God himself passing by this child that's dying. And saw you lying in your blood. And I said to you as you lay in your blood, live. Thus declares the Lord. He told this child to live. It was a commandment. This child was going to live because we all know that when God speaks, it is final. It is absolute. What he says accomplishes is its purpose. There's no if and or buts about it. He is sovereign king. He has no equal, no second. He is alone and he is all powerful. And he has spoken that this child would live. What the world had intended, what his own parents had intended what the, the, for the baby girl was to, to turn her over to death. To leave her in the desert. They didn't want her. She was a problem, an inconvenience. But God says, no, live. They intended for you to die, but I intend for you to live. And it's so important that he says this, that it's repeated again. Yes, I said to you, as you lay in your blood, live. Not only does God say live, but he actually nurses this child for a time. We don't know how long. 
It couldn't have been to full maturation based on uh, what we see written here in a few. But it says that I made you thrive like plants in the field. You grew up and matured and became very beautiful. This child, imagine the deformities that could have res resulted from being left and not tying the umbilical cord, not washing off the blood. The own, it's left in its own fetal matter, its own blood. But yet it says that this child was protected, preserved, watched after by the Lord, and grew to be beautiful. It says your breasts were formed and your hair grew, but you were stark naked. I'm kind of left to interpret entirely what's meant here. But I think it's something along the lines that, yes, God nursed this baby girl to health. And she did live. But he must have left for a time, and she wasn't taken care of during that time. She was still left on her own. She was still without a clue. Let me pick up again here in verse 8. But God happens again upon this young lady. Now she, she is at marriageable age. Bear that in mind. Then I passed by you and saw you, and you were indeed at the age for love. So I spread out the edge of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. In your head, you're probably thinking good Samaritan story here, right? That kind of seems to be, that's what it's reminiscent of. But this was no simple matter of clothing the poor woman and covering her up and protecting her from the sun and the weather. No, this was a marriage proposal. This is a, a Near Eastern custom with the cloak, and that's what he's doing. What did this lady have to offer him? absolutely nothing she was despised cast out at her birth but yet God in his, his benevolence chose to make her his I pledged myself to you entered into a covenant marriage covenant with you and you became mine you probably heard Brad talk about in his sermons about marriage. It was a custom, and we see it actually in the life of Abraham when God's making this covenant with him, that it was customary to split animal carcasses and to lay them in a row. And then whoever was making the covenant that day, the two parties would march through the split carcasses, and they would meet in the middle. Now, the point of the split carcasses, you might ask, is that what they're saying in effect is that if I sever this covenant, if I do not uphold my end of the bargain, what has happened to these animals deserves to happen to me. They took covenant very seriously. But yet it's saying that this king, God, chose to enter into covenant with a young lady who had nothing to offer, no family to account for, nothing. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I washed you with water, rinsed off your blood, and anointed you with oil. He is looking after her yet again. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and provided you with leather sandals. I also wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with jewelry, putting bracelets on your wrist and a chain around your neck. He is giving her everything. He is not holding anything back. He is not sparing any expenses. He is a king, and he has money. And he is giving her all these things to make her even more beautiful. And it said that she was already beautiful. But he is adding upon that. I put a ring in your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful tiara on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothing was made of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. Not only she's just wearing the most extravagance of clothes at this point. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. She had a wonderful diet, a kingly diet. You became extremely beautiful and attained royalty. That's the kicker. She was made, by default, when a woman marries a king, she becomes a queen. It's reminiscent of those, like the, the beautiful romances and love stories of, of someone of high stature going after someone who's but a peasant, a plebeian. And very much so, that's the case here. This young lady, again, has nothing to offer, but this king is deigning to step down. He is humbling himself and taking her to be his bride. Love is a choice, folks. And he has chosen to love. It's not a fairy tale notion. It's not an emotion that comes and goes. No, it's a solid commitment. It's a choice. It's a covenant from the get-go that regardless of what happens, we're going to stick it out. And that's what he has pledged to her. 
She is now queen. And it says of her that your fame spread among the nations. All the surrounding people are talking about this new bride for the king. Because of your beauty. But notice the source of the beauty. For it was perfect through my splendor which I had bestowed on you. Church, you had nothing to offer God. And you were not a beautiful sight to begin with, but now you are. Because he's bestowed upon you all the riches of heaven and he's made you his. And now he wants you to play the part. Royalty doesn't go around doing the childish things that we do. No, royalty walks with dignity and with manners and kindness and pleasantness. And that's who he's made her to be. But all the while, she can never take credit for any of this. But all that is beautiful is because it originates in God. And again, that, that phrase, this is the declaration of the Lord God, you will find that scattered throughout the book. So a summary of what happens. I wish I could tell you that the lady was so moved by kindness that she went on to recreate that and to do that. But no, the rest of the chapter is horrific. And it details deplorable accounts of this woman sleeping with man after man, person after person, never faithful to her king and her husband, her groom. That's the sad state of things. That's what becomes of her. All the while, bearing in mind, this is Ezekiel speaking on behalf of God, stating that this is who Israel is. Israel has not been faithful to her king, to her groom. She has gone away and she has whored after others. She has made and found new kings and she lives to serve them. No wonder God left the temple. But I want to read to you another verse found at the very end of this chapter. I'm reading in verse 62. This is in retrospect of all that she has now done in view of the whole chapter. God talking, I will establish my covenant with you and you will know that I am Yahweh, that I am Lord of Lord, God of gods. So that when I make atonement for all that you have done, you will remember and you will be ashamed and never open your mouth again because of your disgrace. This is the declaration of the Lord God. After she has gone and done all of this, squandered it all, I have the prodigal son in mind here, who has given a horrible gift in return to her king by going and living this heinous life. God says, I will make restitution. I will make atonement. Even though I had nothing to do with this because you were my bride, because I made covenant with you, I will pay the price for what you have done. I will absorb the cost. Church, I don't know how you would have anything else in mind at this point. Um, but the sad reality that, yes, this was written to the people of Israel in 600 B.C. But if you don't find even a glimmer of yourself in the people of Israel, then I think you've missed the point. Because the reality is, you've whored after other gods. You have left your king. You've not always been faithful. You definitely weren't before you were saved. But while you were in the most pitiable state, Romans 5, 8, right? Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But yet your king sent his son to die on the cross that your forgiveness might be made possible. Your sin atoned for. Blood had to be spilled because a wrong had been incur incurred. And so what does God do? Is he not sparing, but sends his son, right? To pay the price that you might have the forgiveness of your sins. That you might be reconciled with your king. He has declared that you shall live. He has declared that you shall be his bride. Uh, 
I, I was excited to tie this in. Um, I don't know how many of you are Star Wars fans. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Um, but if you're aware, Nisa Hubbub News uh, recent, Disney Plus has launched. Uh, if you don't know what Disney Plus is, it's a streaming service like Hulu or Netflix. And they had special release titles to try to garner interest in what they were showing. Not only could you, could you fulfill your sense of nostalgia and watch all the old cartoons you grew up with or all the Disney movies you love that are no longer found on other sites, and now you don't have to pay $20 a movie, you can watch their stuff on this channel. Well, the release title for the biggest one, without a doubt, was The Mandalorian. Uh, if you don't know what that is, the story is about a character whom we don't know the name of because it is common for his people to keep their, their, their true selves kept secret because of the, what they do for a living. They are bounty hunters. They have been trained and prepared through years of, of hard labor and training to take on this role, this mantle. And they earn in varying degrees their armor that they wear. And it's made of this very very special steel and if you wear that armor you are known as a Mandalorian and so this it this whole show features around this one Mandalorian figure that is rising in the ranks who is gaining his armor well he's given this massive task by a certain individual and he's told him to, to go and recover this package well when he arrives on this foreign planet he sees these weird creatures and uh, he also encounters another man, creature, another alien species that's very small in stature. And this little man, small in stature, you just get the feeling that he's wise and that he's good and that he knows what he's talking about. And the Mandalorian meets him and says, and kind of reveals to him, like, hey, I'm here for this. He knew he was a Mandalorian just by seeing him, and he's like, hey, I know what you're here for, and I want to help you. And he wanted to help him because he would get something in return that these pirates would be kicked out of his, his area. And so the, the man offers to help him. He says, I will get you where you need to go because I know where you need to go, but there's only one way to get there. You're going to have to ride on one of these strange creatures. And uh, it's kind of a comical scene where he gets bucked off and gets angry and kind of wants to give up after the first try. But this little man who's small in stature but yet very wise tells him, no, you've got to get back up there. You've got to do this. You're a Mandalorian. Are you going to back down from this challenge? And so he does. He saddles up. And he learns to ride the thing. And off they go to find the package. And I won't spoil it for you. But why do I share this story with you? Is this little man who's small in stature that beyond a doubt is wise and just and good, every time he says something meaningful, he holds his hand up in the air and he says, I have spoken. And it's comical at first. But the Mandalorian acknowledges it and he respects it. Never once does the Mandalorian open his mouth after that man says, I have spoken. And it is a beautiful thing. And, and I tie that in because when God has spoken, when he says, thus have I declared, final. It's absolute. There's nothing you can say. There's no point you can argue. What he says is going to happen. He's going to bring it to pass because God is perfectly just and faithful to what he says. You can hang on that. You can hang your hat on that. And that's what he's declared. He said to this child, you will live. And he said to her, you'll become my bride. And she was. And he was faithful to the covenant. Uh, many commentators will, will tell you that a lot of this may be a reference to the history of Israel. Uh, clearly, we have the Abraham tie-in, but also that when the covenant was made anew, that that was the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, uh, as well as their time in in Egypt under Pharaoh's rule. And, and I wouldn't argue with that, that you very well could make that case. Um, but churches, as we draw to a conclusion here, you're, maybe you're wondering still how this ties in for you. Um, and my point is to draw your attention to the fact that, again, you had nothing to offer God, but he chose in his kindness to come to your aid. He chose to go out of his way to lavish his gifts upon you and to make restitution for the sins that you have committed. 
And sadly, Israel doesn't immediately turn around, right? They continue in this estate, uh, really kind of all, all the years of, and it, maybe even to today, there's still wanderings. Um, but church, you can be found, and, and you know who your king is. He's made himself available to you. The fact that God speaks through Ezekiel, what that teaches me, is that God wants to be heard. He wants to communicate with you. Um, maybe you can identify also with the child um, the reality is you were dead in your sins you were left to die by choosing to sin what does it say that sin leads into death but God wanders by he looks over at you and he says to you live so church live and don't go on sinning Wake up, be faithful to your king. As Thanksgiving's around the corner, the age-old question is, what are you thankful for? My question to you is, how thankful are you for, what, for everything that God has done to make you his own?